This video is brought to you by CuriosityStream and Nebula. See my exclusive Nebula series, Mysteries of the Human Body, and get a year of CuriosityStream for less than $15 when you click the link in the description. When most of us think of nanotechnology, something like this might come to mind. Yeah, nanotech in films and movies are basically just future magic, you know, just some wondrous technology that can do anything we can think of and make the impossible possible. And that's not really a far cry from how we treat it in real life, too. I mean, the thought that we can just manipulate atoms means that we could create materials and chemicals that not only we could never have dreamed of, but nature could never have dreamed of. Does nature dream? Or are we the dream of nature? <laughs> Trippy. From self-assembling construction to machines that can crawl through our blood and eradicate disease and cancer, so much of our hopes for the future are wrapped up in this one idea. And it's not a new idea. Bill Clinton was pushing for nanotech research in 1999, saying that someday we'll make materials that are 10 times stronger than steel, but at a fraction of the weight that we'll be able to shrink the Library of Congress down to the size of a sugar cube and detect cancers within just a few cells in size. Futurologists Ian Pearson and Ian Neal of British Telecom claimed in 2005 that, quote, in the next 60 years, we will see nanotechnology and biotechnology making impacts on our life that might seem magic to us, but will be quite normal to our children's children. And then there's graphene, which is essentially a two-dimensional nanomaterial. It won the Nobel Prize for Physics in 2010 with breathless headlines saying it would transform things like construction, health, electronics, and energy. In fact, the European Union committed over $1.3 billion in 2013 to figure out exactly what graphene could do over the next 10 years. And here we are now, almost 10 years later, and more than 20 years after Bill Clinton's predictions. And some of this has come true. In labs, anyway. But how close are we to those crazy future predictions that we were making? Or were those predictions just way too over-optimistic? Where are we exactly with nanotechnology? Fortune Magazine defines nanotechnology as, quote, the science of building machines and materials at the molecular level, where key components are measured in nanometers, or one billionth of a meter. So when somebody says they're working at the nanoscale, that means they're working with matter that's between one and a hundred nanometers. And there are a lot of analogies out there to try to conceptualize things at this scale. It's kind of challenging to get it across. But for example, one red blood cell is 7,000 nanometers wide. Actually, thick, not wide. So narrow. Yeah. Or if you look at your arm hair, which I have plenty of because I'm part Sasquatch, one hair is about 50,000 nanometers wide. So we're talking about manipulating matter tens of thousands of times smaller than that. It's kind of crazy to think about. And one of the first people to think about it no surprise here, was Richard Feynman. He kind of introduced the whole concept of nanotechnology at a meeting of the American Physical Society in 1959 in a lecture he called, There's Plenty of Room at the Bottom. And he asked during this lecture, quote, why can't we write the entire 24 volumes of the Encyclopedia Britannica on the head of a pen? He then went on to describe a vision of using machines to build smaller machines down to the molecular level. And many of his ideas have been proven correct, which is why he's sometimes called the father of nanotechnology. And many other things. Richard Feynman was really cool. In 1974, Japanese scientist Norio Tamaguchi first used and defined the term nanotechnology as, quote, mainly consisting of the processing and separation, consolidation, and deformation of materials by one atom or one molecule. But things really took off in the 80s. In 1981, Gerd Benning and Heinrich Rohrer at IBM's Zurich lab invented the scanning tunneling microscope. This allowed scientists to create direct spatial images of individual atoms for the first time. They would later win the Nobel Prize for this in 1986. That same year, Benning, Calvin Quaid, and Christoph Gerber invented the atomic force microscope. This gave scientists the ability to view, measure, and manipulate materials down to fractions of a nanometer in size. These were the advancements that were needed to actually visualize and manipulate atoms. Pretty important step. And after that, we got nanotubes, graphene, and buckyballs. And atomic animations. But there have been some practical applications that have made its way into everyday commercial products that you might not know about. For instance, nanoscale additives to fabric surfaces can provide lightweight energy deflection in personal body armor. And they can also help them resist bacterial growth, staining, and wrinkling. 
Nanoscale materials are starting to be used to create durable and washable smart fabrics. These fabrics can include flexible nanoscale electronics and sensors for health monitoring, energy harvesting through movement, and solar energy capture. Clear nanoscale films on cameras and computer displays, eyeglasses, windows, and other surfaces can help them keep residue and water off. They can also make them more antimicrobial, anti-reflective, chemically conductive, resistant to fog, scratch resistant, and protect users from ultraviolet or infrared light. Nanoscale additives and polymer composite materials are being used in automobile parts, baseball bats, bicycles, luggage, motorcycle helmets, and tennis rackets to help make them lightweight, durable, resilient, and stiff. That was a lot of nouns and adjectives. And maybe the most obvious use of nanotech is in computers and electronics. I mean, just look at what's happened to transistors over the years. Transistors went from 130 to 250 nanometers in size to currently around 5 nanometers in size. Although the Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory did create a transistor with a working one nanometer gate in 2016. And as somebody is already typing in the comments, I'm sure we're actually getting down to the point where we're reaching the theoretical limits because quantum effects are starting to kind of weirdify things. TVs are now using nanostructures to enhance colors. You might have heard of quantum dot TVs. Um, I've seen them in stores, didn't really know what they're all about. But yeah, those do use quantum dots. They're nanostructures. And what they do is they absorb light over a certain range of wavelengths and then emit light in different wavelengths based on their composition or size. And then you have the aforementioned carbon nanotubes, which are cylindrical molecules rolled up in the sheets of single layer carbon atoms. They come in single wall and multi wall configurations, and they too have gotten a lot of hype over the years with people touting the engineering miracles they would usher in. And they are starting to live up to the hype, improving the efficiency of things like the coating of wind turbine rotor blades, industrial robot arms, hulls, masts, and other parts of sailboats, bulletproof vests, and sporting goods like golf clubs, kayaks, and skis. And while we may not have microscopic machines coursing through our veins just yet, nanotech has been advancing the medical field in significant ways. For example, carbon nanotubes can serve as gene delivery vectors in treating breast cancer, broken bones, and osteoporosis. Nanoparticles are used as antifungals and antimicrobials on medical equipment surfaces. They can function as catalysts and sensors for helping with imaging diagnostics. Dendromers are biodegradable nanopolymers that can help with vaccine testing by acting as antigen carriers. They can even use nanotechnology to manipulate DNA, like in 2017 they did an experiment where they reprogrammed a mouse's skin cells into blood vessel tissue to save its leg. And they did this by tapping the wound with a chip that used nanotechnology to inject uh, DNA into the cells. That's one of the crazier applications and frustratingly still in the testing phase, but it's knocking on the door of some of the more mind-blowing predictions about nanotech. But hype and science fiction aside, there are a few things that are in the development stage that can make a huge difference in the world. Okay, first I have to talk about a system that was developed by MIT back in 2019 that could remove CO2 from the air. And yeah, I know I've talked about this before, but that's because, I don't know, it's, it's just really cool to me. Because most CO2 capture technology is, is chemically based and it takes a lot of energy and it's, you know, needs giant fans to process. This is an incredibly energy efficient system and I think it could be a game changer. It basically moves air through a stack of charged electrochemical plates lined with a layer of polyanthroquinone composed with nanotubes. And simply put, when you run a charge across it, the nanotubes attract CO2 while the rest of the air passes through. Once it becomes saturated, just turn the charge off and collect the CO2. From there, it can be compressed and used in a variety of applications or injected underground for disposal or turned into carbon neutral fuel. It's seriously one of my favorite things that I've ever covered on this channel and it's kind of frustrating that it's not on the market yet, but uh, I'll be okay. And remember when I talked about quantum dots and TVs? Now imagine them in fish. The, the dots, not, not TVs. That would be some really fishy TV. There should be a channel called Fishy TV. I wonder what kind of shows they would show on it. Yeah, I got nothing. Where was I? Quantum fish dots. Right. Last year, researchers at Chang'an University in South Korea used quantum dots to help reveal when fish begins to spoil. The idea is that fish produce an odorless histamine when they start to go bad. So they built a detector that uses these carbon quantum dots that are coated with chemicals, and when those come in contact with the histamine, it fluoresces under ultraviolet light. So now you can trust your eyes instead of just trusting your nose. And here's a pretty cool one. Just last year, researchers created some wood that can be used in flooring, and it creates electricity when you step on it. It was a team at ETH Zurich, and they used a fungus that can make the wood piezoelectric, meaning it can produce electric charge in response to mechanical stress. Dr. Ingo Bergert and his colleagues infected balsa wood with Ganoderma aplantium. I think that's how it's pronounced. It's called, it's a, it's a white rot fungus is what it's called. 
And they discovered after 10 weeks that the wood could be compressed more than the uninfected wood, but then would return to its original shape. Also, the compression generated almost 60 times higher voltage than the untreated wood. So when they connected nine of these infected wood blocks in parallel, they were able to generate enough power to light an LED bulb when the wood was compressed. So maybe someday office buildings or even stadiums could generate energy just from the people walking around in them. That'd be cool. Speaking of energy efficiency, some researchers are working on a way to use nanotechnology to make aircraft more efficient. They showed last year how adding graphene oxide nanoparticles to liquid ethanol can boost the fuel's burning rate by up to 8.4%. They say that the nanoparticles increase the atomization of the fuel, which can both increase power and lower amounts of carbon emissions. And last, but very not least, some researchers are combining nanotechnology with artificial intelligence to create precision cancer medicine that can target specific cancer cells without harming healthy tissue. So all good things, very cool things that can make our lives better, though nothing quite as crazy as what we see in the movies. That doesn't mean it's not without its downsides, because every atom-sized rose has a proton-sized thorn. For one thing, nanoparticles used in medicine could become toxic after entering the body, depending on their chemical and physical properties. I mean, sure, nanotechnology might be able to curb diseases and illnesses, but we don't know for sure what the long-term effects are and how they could affect the body. Not to mention they need to be handled properly. One study showed that 80% of human lung cells died when exposed to copper oxide and zinc oxide nanoparticles. Christine K. Payne of Duke University studies the inhalation of nanoparticles, and her lab found lots of unexpected genetic and molecular effects after breathing in nanoparticles, even those deemed safe by traditional toxicology tests. Payne told The Guardian in 2019, quote, what all labs doing such research are seeing right now is that there are effects beyond toxicity. So you can work at non-toxic concentrations, but still see, for example, an oxidative stress response that can lead to inflammation. Do these more subtle effects matter, especially over long-term exposure? Similarly, we don't fully understand how nanoparticles can affect the environment and ecology. And then there's the dreaded gray goo scenario. For the record, this is way far ahead of where we are right now, but if you have, you know, tiny nanomachines that are programmed to build other tiny nanomachines, molecule by molecule, that can get out of hand and uh, we wouldn't be able to stop it. And the fear is that eventually these microscopic assemblers would just convert all organic matter into more assemblers and consume everything in the world in the process, turning the whole world into a kind of gray goo. This is sort of similar to the idea of a paperclip machine becoming sentient and with its only directive to create more paperclips it eventually destroys the whole solar system and turns the whole thing into paperclips. But really these are more thought experiments than anything. So yeah, self-replicating nanobots are still pretty far away, but we do have some success manipulating already existing biological micro machines like bacteria and viruses to make them do our bidding. This could go a long way to fixing genetic issues by reprogramming viruses in a process called reverse transcription. So instead of it entering its own virus DNA into a cell, it can insert repaired DNA that corrects a genetic abnormality. The virus then works as a vector to sort of spread that DNA around the body. And this is already happening in various trials around the world. This could be the first step to creating more sophisticated programmable nanobots in the future. So like many things in science fiction, the dreams of nanotechnology don't line up completely with what we know is possible. Doesn't mean there aren't some really cool things on the horizon though. You might be surprised, I, I know I was, at how many common things we use every day that have nanotechnology in them right now, or have been improved by nanotechnology in some small way. Pun intended. But if you really want to take a deep dive on the promise of nanotechnology, there's a whole series you should check out called The Nano Revolution on CuriosityStream. Okay, full disclosure, sometimes I have to stretch a little to come up with a suitable Curiosity Stream link for a video, but this is the whole series on this very topic. Like, why did I even bother making this video? It's a three-part series on how nanotechnology will revolutionize medicine, the environment, and engineering, featuring interviews with the experts out there that are making that future happen in labs all around the world. It covers a lot of ground I couldn't get into in this video, obviously. I was looking at where nanotech is today. This is looking more at where it's gonna be in the next 10 to 20 years. This, of course, is just one of thousands of documentary series on CuriosityStream from some of the best documentary filmmakers around the world. And if you like the kind of content I cover on my channel, this is definitely the streaming service for you. Even better, with your subscription to CuriosityStream, you get free access to Nebula, the streaming service I'm a part of, as well as many of your other favorite YouTube channels where you can watch our videos ad-free. That means both pre-rolls and these sponsor messages like you're hearing right now. Oh, don't believe me? Then go sign up for Nebula and see for yourself. Go ahead, prove me wrong. And of course, Nebula is the only place where you can watch my six-part series, Mysteries of the Human Body, which covers all the weird and surprising ways our bodies have kept us guessing over the years. Like, do you know what a teratoma is? It's a tumor made up of hair and teeth. Some real David Cronenberg shit. go check it out. And you, dear viewer, can get this bundle for 26% off an annual subscription, making it a grand total of 14.79. 
That is not per month, that is per year for two streaming services. Yeah. So if you're curious, just head over to curiositystream.com slash Joe Scott to get started. It's seriously the best streaming deal on the planet and I recommend both services. I enjoy both of them. I think you will too. So yeah, curiositystream.com slash Joe Scott, do it. You'll like it. Big thanks to CuriosityStream for supporting this video and a huge shout out to the Answer Files on Patreon who are forming an awesome community, being really cool people and helping me out in, in so many ways. I can't thank you enough. Uh, there's some new people that have joined. Let me murder their names real quick. We got Mississippi Mishmash, uh, Jose Chavez, Eric Weiss, James Joyce, Petra Cor, Carl Lictify, uh, Carlos Fuentes, Robert Dennett, Andrew Mater, Elizabeth Thering Titherington, Elizabeth Titherington, uh, Rashawn Bell, Joe L, Willie Hilly Billy, Michael H, and Cindy Akins. Uh, thank you guys so much. If you'd like to join them, get early access to videos, get access to exclusive live streams, and access to an amazing community, you can just go to patreon.com slash answerswithjoe. Please do like and share this video if you liked it. And if this is your first time here, Google thinks you might like this one. So yeah, give it a look, see, see what you think. Just, yeah, just click right there, it's a good thing. Uh, and you can look at any of the other videos down here on the side that have my face on them. Go check them out. And if you enjoy them and you want to see more, I do invite you to subscribe. Come back to videos every Monday. Cool, that's it for now. You guys go out there, have an eye-opening rest of the week. Stay safe, and I'll see you next Monday. Love you guys, take care.